Yeah. I want to thank Pastor Josh and the session for giving me an opportunity to once again share the Word of God with you. Uh, everyone that is here to, to worship the true God and to rejoice in his blessings to us. Um, I hope that the message I bring will speak to your hearts and minds as we seek to draw closer to God. Will you join me in prayer? Now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. For we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'll be reading from Romans chapter 14. I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's word. I'll be reading verses 1 through 13. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should fully con be convinced fully in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For, it is, for to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in a way of a brother. This is the word of the Lord. May it be words of life and hope for us today. Amen. Please be seated. Stepping back into the sanctuary today reminds me that on an August evening, or I guess it was in the morning, that Friday morning, when we met, and the Presbytery examined and approved the call of our new pastor, Paul Murashan, to be pastor at Covenant Presbyterian Church in Sun City West. At, after 28 months of praying, preparing, and searching, much soul searching, I would add, since we had lost our previous pastor suddenly and unexpectedly. We formed a search committee who began searching for candidates, and then from the list of candidates that we had, searching for the right man and family to come to be with us. We read the PIFs, the Pastor Information Form. We had our own CIF, Church Information Form, that we put together after input from the whole congregation. What are we looking for in a pastor? What do we want? What do we need? We also listed in the CIF the resources available to us, both human resources, the building and facilities, monies in the bank, and that sort of thing to carry on the work of God in our community. We addressed our vision and our goals for the future and how we hoped God would use us in moving forward. We established priorities, primarily the message sermons and Bible studies to share the word of God, to get the word out to others wherever they might be, but also ministry on a daily, weekly, and seasonal basis. You know, we're getting close to Advent season, aren't we? And uh, different churches address that different ways. Uh, we're looking forward. We have a big decoration day, and we have people come in and decorate, and then uh, health and weather permitting, we have a big chilly lunch or something. It's always fun. But then there's mission, both local and international. Here in our presbytery, we have the work of Barrio Nuevo in South Phoenix, reaching out to the Hispanic community and others there. Closer to home here, a ministry to the First Nations, sharing the gospel with them and growing with them in faith and understanding. And as these 
these foundational documents were put together in a search for a pastor, they were probably more of a consensus than unanimity in some of the points. Because you know there's sometimes differences of opinion in a church. You ever heard that? Ever experienced that? The search was directed by the qualifications spelled out in the Bible looking for a pastor, using the familiar verses of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, talking about the bishop and the elder, the presbyteros, episcopos, one is the title, one is the function of that office. And also Deuteronomy 6.5, repeated by Jesus in Luke 10.7, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But Jesus added to that, reminded them of the second great commandment in Leviticus 19.19, 19, Love your neighbor as yourself. We want those qualities in a pastor, but we want that in the membership of the church as well. Now, early in my pastoral ministry, which by the end of next month will be 45 years, no, I was not ordained at the age of eight. I'm a little older than that. <laughs> but I was introduced to a list of what they call the six great ends of the church, the six great purposes of the church. And I'll share these with you quickly. The first and foremost is the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind. Hopefully all Christians can agree that is our first and foremost task, to share the good news with others. But then there's, secondly, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, being able to come together for worship, for study, for fellowship, for just having fun together, to be a body together, to support one another when there is hurting and when there is need. The third is the maintenance of divine worship, which we do here. You do well each week, and we also continue to search on for ways that we can honor God according to his revealed word and led by it. The fourth is the preservation of the truth. You know, the word conservative, we think of that politically a lot of times and sometimes religiously, but conservative means to conserve, to preserve what is valuable. The Reformation was a rediscovery of those, those principles, those matters of faith that were shared and have been shared since that time. The fifth point they have is the promotion of social righteousness, which I would not confuse with today's social justice issues, but looking for God's righteousness to be carried out in, the, in every life, in every community, in every circumstance. And then finally, point six, the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. Each day, I pray, as part of my prayers, Lord, let others see more of you in me and hear more of you through me. And I hope that that is our goal and our mindset, that wherever we go, people are seeing Christ in us. You don't want to be in a situation where they say, you're a Christian? Boy, that's not what I expect out of a Christian with that kind of language or that behavior or that kind of uh, showing around. So we want to be careful how we exhibit the kingdom of God on earth. These are general priorities of the purpose of the church. But what does it all look like in practical day-to-day application? Now this congregation went through the same process looking for a pastor a couple of years ago, and frankly, I think he did a pretty good job. I think he went up with a pretty good preacher. And I went through part of it with you. I was up here on different occasions while that was going on and got to know many of you and appreciated those opportunities. I was glad you were called, but it was a little sad not to keep coming up here to preach on a regular basis. But the question I have for you today as a congregation is, did this process bring you closer together in your shared desire to find a new pastor and his family? Has the resulting implementation of your declared goals and priorities and preferences strengthened or weakened your ties as a church? What issues have you had to sort through over the last couple of years? What have been your priorities as a congregation and your preferences and your guideposts? The guideposts being, of course, scripture, but history and your personal experience. All these things contribute to that. What style of worship have you had and are using now? I remember hearing this one time, and you may have heard it before. There are basically four styles of worship. That service that is all traditional from top to bottom and everything is you know, the way we've done it for 500 years. Then there's a service that's traditional, but with some contemporary brought into it, some of the music and some other activities as well. Then there's a contemporary service that has a little bit of tradition left in it to be shared as such. 
And then finally, there's a contemporary service, or what we call the Hey Dude service, where everything is just you know, very, uh, very modern uh, in the way they do all things. What kind of worship do you have and do you want? Christian education is important as well, whether it's on-site or in home, as the pastor is describing, small groups a couple of times a month and in the, sink, in the church together different times. Uh, some of us have churches that are, are so small that when we get together, we consider we are a small group <laughs> when we meet as a congregation. But we can still break down into smaller groups as well. As far as Christian education goes, do you always use all PCA-approved resources? Does it have the imprimatur of the General Assembly? Or do you use other resources from other believers that can also prove to be useful? Some people have trouble with looking outside the PCA for materials, and others have trouble being restricted to just the materials offered by the PCA. I don't know. And then there's outreach. Outreach and evangelism, sharing the gospel to peoples in, that may have never heard it, even though they've grown up in America where the churches have been so prolific for centuries, and yet there's a lot of people that have never heard the gospel or only seen corrupted versions of the church and church leadership in TVs and movies. And then there's missions, which is a little different from, from evangelism. Evangelism is objectively proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, the points of, of the gospels to people. Uh, missions is more of a cross-cultural event. And again, you don't have to go overseas to do that. You can do that within your own community. The world has come to America, and there are people from different cultures all over the place. Uh, when I was doing evangelism explosion training down in Florida, our small group went to a little shopping center, a little strip mall, and one of the examples they teach us about faith in, in the scripture, we, we, we learn as Americans, well, you know, who was George Washington, our first president? How long ago did he live? Hundreds of years ago. Uh, do you believe that he was our first president? Well, yeah, you've never met him or anything like that. Well, I was ready to share that with somebody. We come across this young fellow with long blonde hair and start talking to him. He's on vacation from Sweden. Ah, but I have a Scandinavian background. So instead of talking about George Washington, I said, uh, what do you know about King Gustav Adolf, Gustavus Adolphus? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, do you ever meet him? Do you ever, you know, do you, the things attributed to him, how do you know they're truly his? So you, you contextualize the gospel in one sense, uh, not, not in any way compromising the gospel, but talking to people in terms that they understand. The church is also to be engaging the world in moral issues, which there are plenty to choose from right now, aren't there? Right here in our own country. And then there's the whole issue of church and state and what is meant by separation of church and state. You know, this didn't even, well, this came up in the uh, colonial period when a fellow named uh, Roger Williams made the folks of the Massachusetts Bay Colony so upset they kicked him out, so he went a little further east and started his own uh, colony, became known as Rhode Island. And he addressed the issue of, um, you know, separation, uh, a wall between the church and the state. Uh, but I'll explain a little bit what he meant by that, too. He was more Baptistic in his background, establishing the Baptist church there. When Thomas Jefferson was our president in the very early 1800s, the Danbury Baptist Convention wrote him and said, we've heard a rumor that they're going to declare this or that group the state church of the United States, like many states in Europe have, you know, the Lutheran Church, Catholic Church, the Reformed Church in different countries. And he wrote back to them in January 1st of 1802, <clears throat> saying, in, in essence, there is a wall of separation, as Mr. Williams addressed, but it is a wall that's meant to keep the government out of interference in the church. It is not meant to keep the church from influencing and addressing the government. Big difference, isn't there? We are to be voices spoken up on the issues of the day. When the church remains silent, evil spreads. And so anyhow, we want to be involved in informing and influencing the policies and laws of government. I remember going to a General Assembly in Columbia, South Carolina many years ago, and up to that point, the PCA had a strong uh, policy of you know, not getting involved in politics and government issues and that sort of thing, but something had come up, and I can't remember exactly what it was. We were meeting in an auditorium uh, at this school, and it was passed to say, well, okay, someone submitted a document asking people to sign on to it, to be sent to the governor to address whatever the issue was. And the state of clerk said, well, I guess if you want to sign it, you can come down and do that. Men were climbing over the rows of chairs and trying to get out to get down there to sign that because they wanted to express their support for that biblical principle as it affected 
the life of our government. What about the first century church that we've read about here in Romans? Paul is writing to the church in Rome. He wrote to a church full of converts. Think about it. They were all first or at most second generation Christians. Timothy would have been a, if you consider him second or third, if his mother and grandfather, or mother and grandmother believed at the same time or not. But anyhow, they're all new. The, the Jews had the strong biblical foundation of what we call the Old Testament that Paul and others kept referring back to, showing how Christ fulfilled the prophecies, etc. But the Gentiles who were coming into the church were from diverse pagan religions, polytheistic for the most part. Some were monotheistic, of course, the Jews were monotheistic. Uh, Zoroastrians from what is now uh, Iran area were pretty much, I believe, uh, monotheistic. But they had moral issues to address, dietary issues to address, issues regarding sacred days and seasons, as we've just read here in Romans 14. This church in Rome may not have been great in number, but it was in the capital of the entire empire. It was at the crossroads of worldviews, whether traitors or soldiers who had brought different views and even religions from distant outposts or slaves who had been brought away from their homes to serve masters there in Rome, bringing their traditions and beliefs as well. Even then, the church was struggling with people's religious baggage. People brought beliefs from their old religions and, and even from Judaism that they couldn't quite mesh with their understanding of Christianity. It was a learning process. Think how hard it was for Peter when he had the vision up in, in Acts chapter 9 and, and God you know, spoke from heaven and said to him, kill and eat, and seen all the animals. And he said in essence, God, I hear you, but I'm a good Jewish boy, and I've never eaten that stuff, and I know I'm not supposed to eat it. God had to tell them three times, what I have declared clean, you shall not declare unclean. It was addressing dietary laws, but it was also addressing reaching out to Gentiles as well. So what do you eat? What do you drink? Paul talks about people that basically keep kosher, those that eat meat, those that are vegetarian, my favorite, omnivores, that'll eat anything. That's, that's just about anything. But also, uh, what days to observe? Uh, new moons and Sabbaths and major festivals of Judaism and, and perhaps other religions as well. What do you drink? Do you just drink water? Do you drink wine? Uh, what, what are your options there? Remember, Paul had to tell Timothy to drink a little wine for his stomach. It would be good for it. So Paul is writing to believers who have among them other believers who he calls weak in faith. They're still transitioning from the worldly cultures and practices that they've grown up with, perhaps generations of that ingrained in them, as well as those coming from Old Testament Judaism. And they're, so they're transitioning because Jesus opened some doors. You know, he said, I didn't come to end the law, I came to fulfill the law. Well, what does that look like? And he explained that to us. Um, as we said in, in the chapter, excuse me, Acts 10, where, where Paul or Peter uh, is being given the imminent ministry to Gentiles, remember the Roman centurions, people showed up right after he'd had the vision, said, we'd like you to come to our master's house. He's, he's, a, he's a Roman, but he's a God-fearer. God-fearers were Gentiles who believed in the God of the Bible, but had not taken the final steps to fully convert to Judaism, but they would worship the true God. Paul says to the church in Rome, as he says to us today, welcome them that may be weak in the faith, but not to quarrel over opinions. Choose your battles. You know, there are, there are crucial things. You know, in, in our Book of Church Order, we talk about men who are being considered for ordination. Do they have a, a how's the wording go? It's a, they may have a different understanding of some things, but they don't strike at the heart or the vitals of our religion. So there's a little wiggle room for what you understand about creation or Sabbath observance and that sort of thing, even within our PCA. Do not despise, do not look down upon or those who are, seem to be less spiritual, or those who do more or less of something that you would do in dietary preferences. I have a good friend back in Texas, Yogi, and uh, his background was Hindu. His family was from India, still has relatives there. Uh, he met a, a, a nice gal, and Suzanne, they got married, he became a Christian. And he's a devout Christian, he loves the Lord, but he still won't eat meat, which is a, a leftover kind of a thing from his Hindu background. And I didn't give him a hard time about that. Leaves more for me. <laughs> but we have those kind of issues. And don't pass judgment on them because they act differently than you do. 
You know, we have churches that are very formal in all that they do, some that are very uh, modernistic in the way they express things, and some that are in between. But are they all intending to glorify God? If so, God bless them. For God has welcomed them. Well, if God has welcomed them, I guess we should too. Because we are fellow servants of God with them. Remember, God saves us where we're at. God saves us as we are. And then over the process of time, he changes us. He sanctifies us. He makes us and molds us after his will. To be more Christ-like in time. And different people are at different places in that journey. We have to understand that. We have to respect that. We have to accept that. He says we are all servants of the same master, the same Lord, even Jesus Christ. Christ died to save the ungodly, which was all of us and anybody else who's turned to him. Sinners saved by grace. Then he goes on to talk about concerning observing one day or many days. You know, there are some Christians that will worship on Saturday, the old Jewish Sabbath, and say that's when we're supposed to meet. Most of us meet on Sunday, and, but we're all meeting to glorify and honor God. Different ones have different festivals of assembly. Some churches observe the Advent season or the Lenten season. Others don't. And so if they're doing that um, for the reason of glorifying God, God bless them. But Paul says, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Whatever you decide to do, whether it's eating or drinking or fellowshipping or worshiping, it should be done for the glory of God. You know, whatever you choose to do is your goal to honor the Lord. Is your goal to give thanks to God? He says in verses 7 through 9, none of us lives to himself or dies to himself. We live to the Lord, we die to the Lord, because we are the Lord's. Didn't Paul say elsewhere, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, as he rules in our hearts? Again, why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Why do you despise your brother or sister? Because they don't agree with you and your take on things. We will all stand before the judgment seat of God, and each one will give an account of his own life. He's not going to ask you about your neighbor. He's not going to ask you about your children or your your spouse or whoever. He's going to ask you about yourself. What did you do in your walk of faith? And so we have to be ready for that day. Now, elsewhere in Philippians, Paul writes about a couple of women, co-laborers, he calls them, dedicated Christians who had a falling out over something. We're not told what, but Yodia and Syntyche, they're in Philippi. And he says here in Philippians 4, I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, to help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Wow. True Christians can have differences of opinion. True Christians can have fallings out. But what sets us apart from the world is we find a way to fall back in. We find a way to be reconciled through Christ. The world wants to put up barriers, run from each other, and say good riddance. We are called to seek healing, reconciliation, restoration in our relationships and in our church life as well. Consider Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to hell, a fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go, for... First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. We're having communion later. And if the service of communion is proceeding with Pastor Josh, and there you remember somebody in the room you've got some problems with, and you've never resolved it, I encourage you in Christ, with a humble heart, go quietly tap him on the shoulder and say, let's step out a second. Let's get this resolved. Or if you can't do it here, they're not here, go home and get on the phone and talk to people, go knock on the door, reach out to them, and seek healing and restoration in your relationships. Because that's what is honoring to God. Then come back and offer your gift, as he said. Or Romans 7, where he says, judge not that you be judged. Boy, doesn't the world love to quote that? 
but just that far. Shouldn't judge, judge not lest you be judged. But it goes on to say, for with the judgment you judge others, you also will be judged. So it's saying, be ready to be judged by the same standards you judge others. Let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. I guess the other side of the coin for that is here in Romans 14, 13. Don't be a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of your brother or sister. The world has an attitude in many times of in your face. You know, they want to just get up to you and get in your space and just give you a hard time. But we're to follow the model of Jesus Christ. He didn't come to be in our face. He came to be in your place on the cross. He took your sins all of them, and defeated them and cleansed you from them through his blood. Therefore, we are to refrain from offending, but don't be a hypocrite about it. If you like to have a glass of wine now and then, and there's some people in the church that are total teetotalers and, and just say, you know, it's evil, I don't want anything to do with it, don't go to them and say, yeah, I totally agree with you that that's all wrong, but then go home and have a drink anyway. Just say to them respectfully, well, you know, I'm sorry, I don't agree with your policy completely, but also refrain from drinking wine or something in their presence if you know it's going to bother them. Show courtesy and consideration for that. Don't deny your freedom in Christ, but consider denying your opportunity to exercise your freedom, whether it's food, drink, or something else, for the sake of a weaker brother or sister in the Lord. I can let it go this time. I'll come back to it another time. For in verse 17, we're told in this chapter, for the kingdom of God is not just food and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Lord. Some of you are about the same age as me or thereabouts. How many of you remember singing that song, We Are One in the Spirit, We Are One in the Lord? You know, that was big in the 70s, I know, and probably beyond there some. I want, to, I want to share that with you and think about this as we think about our relationship with one another as Christians. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Now, where do they get that idea? Well, Jesus said in John 13, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. They'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. And we'll guard each man's dignity and save each man's pride. Why? Because all praise to the Father from whom all things come. All praise to Christ Jesus, his only Son. All praise to the Spirit who makes us one. We do have a unity, though there's some diversity among us. We're not always going to unanimously agree on a course for the church, but if you have a consensus, learn to humble yourself and go along with the group and see how things play out, praying for whatever is resolved. So my question to you as I'm wrapping up this morning is, is this where you are at today as a church? Would you walk hand in hand with the brothers and sisters that are here in this fellowship? Would you work side by side with them in the kingdom of God? Will you take this cup and eat this bread with them today without animosity, without anger, without hatred? If not, would you explain your reluctance to do so and your refusal to do so to the Lord Jesus who commands you to love one another with the agape love? which is not a warm, fuzzy feeling, but it's a will, an act of the will to put the other first, to cherish the other, to value the other. If there are barriers in your life, go to Jesus, even today, to the one you are estranged from. Talk to your pastor or elders about helping to resolve an issue if you want a referee involved. By this, Jesus says, all men will know that we are his disciples if we have this kind of love for one another. 
I pray that for this church, for the church in Sun City West, for all the churches of our presbytery across this land, for every church, whatever the sign says on the outside, if they're there to worship the living, the living God through the Lord Jesus Christ, then God bless them and let us value them. If you've ever, just wrap up, if you've ever traveled in parts of the country, or the world, I should say, like in Nigeria or in Israel or other countries, uh, communist uh, or former communist Russia or Ukraine, where atheism and other dominant religions have been there all along. When you find someone else that professes to be a Christian, even though they, their, their denomination name may start with an A or an M or a B or whatever, you're glad to see them when you're surrounded by 99.9% .9 people who don't love the Lord. Don't wait for that experience. Cherish and value each other within this body and within the larger body of Christ. As you're in cooperative efforts, like we heard about during announcements today, we serve together the same God. We serve to honor him. May God help us all as we seek to be more like him and see more of him in each other. Amen. <clears throat> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this opportunity and pray that something I've said will be of benefit to this congregation and to anyone else listening to this service down the road. May all be done in a way that seeks to glorify and honor you, to build up your church, to build up one another, and to see souls saved. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our living Lord and Savior, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.